mathematician and developmental language disorders. She received her PhD in linguistics from the University of Connecticut in 2007. She worked as a research scientist at the Yale Child, Cent Child Study Center studying developmental language disorder. She joined Wins community here in 2015. Her research focuses on how specific language impairment, developmental dyslexia, autism spectrum disorder, uh, manifest themselves in diverse language, languages and cultures. Her articles have been published in such journals as Language Acquisition, uh, Journal of Child Language, Pediatrics, uh, Scientific Studies of Reading, International Journal of Communication Disorders, and Annals of Dyslexia. Uh, her main research focus is on identifying the universal and language-specific mechanisms affecting language acquisition in children with developmental language disorders. Her most recent work deals with identification of language disorder in Arabic speaking children. Currently, she's involved in an interdisciplinary study of developmental language disorders in an isolated population in Russia, which includes uh, language sample analyses, ERP experiments, and genome sequencing study. She is a collaborate. This is a collaboration with researchers with the University of Houston and St. Petersburg State University in Russia. Another project that she's working on involves developing iPad-based assessment for developmental dyslexia for Russian-speaking children, which is another collaboration with the St. Petersburg State University. The topic that she will discuss in this presentation uh, evolved from her interest in the universal building blocks of syntactic structure as they emerge during the earliest stages of syntactic development, an idea she developed jointly with Dr. Liliana Pogodak, who is present here. She is extremely well published, and she gave me a list of uh, maybe 20 pieces that she's published between, um, between 20, 2010 and now, which is an extraordinary record. So it would take me the entire time for her talk to, <laughs> <laughs> to read them all, but I'll just give you a sample of the things she's working on. Uh, she has an article accepted in the Journal of Orthopsychiatry entitled Sources of Homogeneity and Heterogeneity in Developmental Outcomes of Children with Past and Current Experiences of Institutionalization in Russia. It's a four group comparison. Um, she has in press and in common with uh, scholars in her discipline, she works with teams so that each of these papers is, is produced with a team of other scholars. Uh, so she has in press language development of internationally adopted children, adverse early uh, experiences outweigh the age of acquisition effect, the age of acquisition effect. This is going to be published in the Journal of Communication Disorders. With a group of people, she has a piece that is published in Language Acquisition um, in 2015, Interpretation of Anaphoric Dependencies by Russian-speaking Children with and Without Developmental Language Disorders. And with a group of other people also, in 2015, she has Lexical Processing Deficits in Children with Developmental Language Disorders, an event related potential study, and I'll stop there, but, uh, Thank but you. It's, it's clear that she is a very well uh, published and very busy scholar that has joined a very active group of um, scholars that combined together and formed the linguistics programs at the State University. So uh, please welcome to the podium with a warm applause on this big day, Professor Natalia Bradford. Thank you for such a generous introduction, and thank you everyone for coming. And as Will just said, all my work is collaborative, and so is this work that I'm going to present. 
Um, so, and I would like to start by acknowledging Julian, who was um, my collaborator. So the ideas that I will be presenting today come from a manuscript that we um, submitted. It's currently in review. So basically, it will be the first um, the, the first feedback that I that we will hear. And uh, so Liliana and I worked on this um, over the summer. And um, also the theory of language acquisition that kind of um, uh, provides a foundation for these ideas was inspired by Liliana's work on language evolution. So a gradualist approach to language evolution. You might, most of you are probably familiar with that. Uh, when I heard her um, speak about it and I read um, her work and I thought, well, this just describes, it just kind of captures the essence of how children's utterances unfold in development. And so we also collaborated on that. And then um, the, m most recently, um, um, I um, taught a seminar. And so I'm acknowledging students from the English uh, Linguistic Seminar 6720. Uh, because that was a seminar that um, I taught, but, um, I was new to linguistics at to the linguistics program at that point, and I had to develop a new course to teach. And I was thinking, what what would be the most exciting, or what would be an exciting topic to teach for the students? And I thought, well, language and cognition is very exciting, and usually um, students find it very interesting. So I thought, why why not? And so I developed this course, and. Um, I immersed myself in literature that most, a lot of it was kind of the, the modern incarnation of the Worthian hypothesis that language shapes the way we think. But part of it, um, so after reading all that, I, was st I started to think, well, maybe language, m m maybe it's not Worthian really, but language does have a really important influence um, on the way we think. Um, and it's a universal thing because all humans have language. So I've, I will focus not on this Borthian kind of differences. Different languages give you different point of view and make you think in different ways. But we as humans all have language. We share that. And all languages have basic similarities across them. And uh, this would be basically the answer to the question, this is what makes us human beings smart compared to other species. Um, Actually, as a preamble to the talk, I want to also acknowledge my undergraduate students. Um, when I teach language acquisition, an undergraduate course, I, uh, as a warm-up, I frequently ask the students on the first day of class, I ask them, is it possible to think without language? Um, may I ask you, what do you, what do you think? Is, is thought possible without language? Sure. Yes, usually. Th um, the, the consensus is that yes, and the examples would be, um, for example, a deaf person who was who was raised in a hearing and uh, in, in an environment among hearing people and was never exposed to any um, any language, any, any sign language, or um, couldn't learn spoken languages, would not acquire any language, but you, uh, such an individual would still be capable of thought. People also point out animals seem to think in in way in interesting maybe different than human ways. And yes, infants, babbling infants, can think <laughs> before they can before they can talk. Then um, sometimes I mix it up and I ask the question differently. Um, I give them a hypothetical situation, a terrible kind of a terrible Sophie's choice. Imagine if you had to give up one of your mental faculties. It could be any it, it's an open choice. You can choose to give up language entirely, so you cannot com you know, comprehend or use language. Or instead, you will give up hearing, vision, memory, ability to think, um, make inferences, and retain information. So how many of you would choose to give up language? <laughs> Nobody ever <laughs> says language. You can kind of imagine how you can live without some of you, one of your senses even without memory, uh, if, but if you have language, if, if you give up language, you put yourself in such another isolation that it's difficult to fathom. But not only that, people have this intuition that if you give up language, you will not be able to remember or learn anything because you would not have names for any concepts and you um, 
will also lose memory and you will also lose um, reasoning ability except for things that are immediately accessible to your senses. Um, and that's basically in a nutshell the idea here. Without language, we can think, just like the prelinguistic infant, but we are limited to the kind of thinking that we can do when we rely on um, the information accessible directly to our senses. With language, we become unlimited in the way we can think, and that's what makes us smart. So that's basically the main idea of the talk, and now the long version of that. So first, um, our humans really are smarter than other species. Um, I, I like audience participation, what, what do you think? So, do, do you think that it's a fair statement that humans are the smartest? Makes sense to me. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Okay, yes, and it's a really old view. So uh, the idea was that kind of the, the nature is organized hierarchically from the most primitive to the most complex. And um, of course, the humans are the most complex um, of all the other living beings. And so this, was, this is a really old idea. It goes back to ancient Greeks, to Aristotle, and it was enshrined in the Middle Ages, so he, um, in the Catholic conception of the universe. So this is an um, illustration from a book that dates 1579. And so it depicts the great chain of being, where you can see so the god is an angel on top, and then the humans are next. Um, so the god and the angels, then there are humans, and then there are various beasts, and then plants, and everything in this neat progression of per perfection. And so human, humans are at the top of that um, earthly chain before the angels, and so they exemplify the, the perfection and the, the, the greatest complexity. And in some way we kind of agree that, um, well, we don't really, most of us don't really subscribe to precisely that anymore, um, but we kind of do feel we are kind of superior to other species, and at least in some ways. And um, what, what this is, is um, has um, the label cumulative culture. Humans have managed to create what's called cumulative culture. We collectively employ huge amounts of knowledge and innovation and technology and that is constantly updated um, and improved. And um, so we control, because of that, we've learned how to control our environment in ways that no other species can. We manufacture food and clothing, we use electricity to light our homes, it allowed us to, ex so we heat and cool our homes, it allowed us to expand our range, and we basically occupy any piece of terrain on the planet. Um, we control our health, so we are not just kind of we, we, don't, we don't just adapt to the environment, but we control the environment, we control our reproduction, we learn to communicate across time and space, and of course create art and culture. Not every one of us does all of these things, but we all benefit from, from, from that collectively. So our lives are more pleasant and more secure than the lives of any other species. Um, so, it's in, so cumulative culture is kind of how we can um, justify the answer that maybe we are smarter. And of course, if we look at the human brain, it is the most complex of all the other, um, the brains of all the other species. It's not the size that matters. The elephants have bigger brains than humans. It's not even the ratio of the, of the brain to body that matters. Because apparently, um, if you look at that um, measurement, that something like Marmoset has a larger ratio than humans. But recently, when um, now more modern methods became available and people look at, basically they can count neurons, and if they look at the cerebral cortex, and, and they can see that um, even though the elephant's brain is much bigger than the humans, we have 16.3 billion neurons and the elephant in, in our, in our specifically in the cerebral cortex, not in the entire brain. 
and the African bush elephant only 5.15. So, okay, we have some reasons to be confident in the claim that we are, at least in some ways, smarter than other species. But then, of course, there is this other view, and I think many of us feel a little conflicted. It's a little bit arrogant to think that we are the smartest of the species, because um, other species are also smart. And so basically, if you read the literature on animal cognition, you would um, get this idea that human humans are smart, but that what we have is not unique, it's just different. And um, we do have special cognitive abilities, but so do other species, and all species have the abilities that they need. So we have the abilities that are adaptive to our survival. So monkeys do not uh, need to use cell phones, so, and so they don't have cell phones because they don't need them. The, their living situation does not require them to communicate via a cell phone. And um, so this view at the, um, gave rise to this burgeoning field of popular liter science literature on animal cognition. All of these books are on my reading list. In, in some distant future, I hope to read them all because I'm a big animal lover, and so it kind of celebrates the unique abilities of, of animals, and animals um, are amazing. And so most of them are kind of focusing on the stars of the animal kingdom. You can see, so the primates, of course, are featured. Um, dogs are also featured, um, the, the whales, Interestingly, the octopus is a really smart um, species. Um, and so, so far I haven't been able to read all of these books, but I just did a cursory literature survey to see so what, what abilities can we find in an in animal kingdom. So I looked at various um, articles just when I was preparing for this talk, and I saw, for example, and a lot of these animals are not the star animals that you think about. They're actually very, what we would think, primitive little creatures with very small brains. However, they have interesting abilities. For example, uh, there is a whole literature on social insect nests. So ants and termites build these amazing structures. So this is um, from a paper from the Journal of Experimental Biology. So this is what it looks like. It's a termite nest. It um, attains sizes up to seven meters high and 12 meters in diameter. And it's built by workers, each of each of whom is only one centimeter long in size. So can you imagine? And so this is a scan, um, a CT scan, and then a graph representing the complexity of, of this nest. So um, when I was an undergraduate student a very long time ago in the Soviet Union, I was studying evolution, we were told the dogma was that um, humans are the most evolved of all species, and the measure of that is the use of tools. At that time, at least in my country, in my old country, and I think probably it's here too, maybe so you can correct me, correct me if I'm wrong, it was considered a uniquely human um, achievement to use tools. And of course it's completely false, and um, so crows are amazingly uh, talented, and not only do they use um, and the whole family of the corvids is the crow family. Not only do they use tools, but um, one celebrated crow was in, in a, in, that was in captivity managed to use complex tools. So t making three st taking three sticks, putting them together somehow, and using it as a complex tool, which was also considered impossible by animals. So maybe they can use one stick, but not fashion something complex out of multiple sticks. Not true, C crows can't. Beavers, this is a huge uh, beaver um, dam, 850 meters long in Canada. So again, animals can do, they, they can manufacture things and they can use tools. Social cognition, some people um, claim that uh, humans are unique in our unique uh, social um, skills and uh, social cognitive abilities. But if you look at what animals can do, so facial recognition, this is from a paper um, in science. So paper wasps, you never would think that about 
um, actually able to they're able to recognize faces, discriminate between faces of different wasps because they live in very complex multi-colony societies, and uh, it's important for them to recognize friend from um, the enemy. And so in the lab, they could actually see that um, they can differentiate two different faces of two different wasps of their own species. Less good if, it's, if you show them wasps from a different species and if it's, if it's something else, some other objects, they could become really bad at differentiating. So, uh, sheep were shown to be able to recognize celebrity faces. So <laughs> Michelle Obama versus um, Emmy Watson. They can, they can tell the difference. Fish can recognize faces of humans. So a, a mirror recognition test is a test that usually, so people used to claim that humans are the only ones and only older, children, older preschoolers um, become able to recognize themselves in the mirror. They do it by uh, surreptitiously painting a red dot on a child's face and then putting them inside of, in front of a mirror. And if the child looks at the mirror and starts rubbing their own forehead, that's how you know that they, rec they know they're looking at themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not only human children that learn, that, that develop this ability, but uh, various primate species, elephants, dolphins. Um, there is, I read an article on how jays, which is not a member of the crow family, can attribute desire um, so they would have a male and a female, and they would, for example, feed the female with one type of seed so that she, she gets completely satiated with that type of food, and then they would give the male, um, and apparently in that species males feed or provide food for the females, so they would give the male a choice of two different foods, the one that the female was satiated on, and a new one, and the jays would choose the new food. So they can actually attribute desire correctly for the correct type of food for the female. Let's say what else? Taking another spatial perspective to um, figure out um, that was shown in many species of um, primates. So that if, if say a female um, wants to groom a non-dominant male, they would go and hide behind the rock. From, so the dominant, so they're not accessible to the dominant male to be, to be viewed because that's not permitted in, in a hierarchy. Even implicit false belief. So false belief attributing a mistaken belief to another person. It's usually tested by an um, unexpected transfer test. So you, uh, two characters, um, one of them places an object in one place, leaves the room, the, the, the second person moves it, the first person comes back, and the question is, where would that person look for the thing that they left? Um, so, in, of course, great apes would not point to the correct location, but their eye gaze indicates that the, the correct location, so where the, um, the person who returns has a mistaken belief and they look at the right original location of the thing. So all of these abilities. Um, very recently, maybe, you heard it was um, a story on NPR and New York Times in the science section about gray parrots and how they, they were shown to be altruistic. So in this experiment, um, they, they were trained, the gray parrots were trained to take a metal token, so you could see their metal tokens right here, and exchange them for food, for treats with them. But then, uh, through this opening, then this opening is closed, so then this uh, parent no longer can pass the tokens to the experimenter. However, he has a friend here and can communicate, and so this parent would pass the tokens to the other parent so that then the, the second parent can, can, can exchange it for a treat. So that's pretty sophisticated social reasoning and cooperation. And then this is my last example, and that for some reason kind of blows my mind completely because it really shows that these species are much supe more superior than human beings in something that we think we're superior. We think we have really good memories, right? We can remember things better than all other animals. But how about, how about these nutcracker crow 
they cache food for future consumption, so they hide seeds to prepare for the winter. So they discovered that they, they hide as many as 30,000 seeds in 6,000 different locations across more than over a mile um, area in the fall, and then, they re then later on they come back, months later in the spring, when the snow melts, they go and retrieve all of those seeds. So they remember exactly where they planted, you know, hid all of these seeds. And uh, of course that's beyond anything any human being could ever do. And um, another member of this family, Western Scrub Jay, they do it even, um, it's, it's also very impressive. They don't hide quite as many seeds in quite as many locations, but they hide different foods of different levels of perishability, and they would remember how perishable the food is and how soon they have to come and retrieve it. So what does that indicate? It indicates mental time travel. They can actually, um, they first of all, they, so it's remembering the past when they hid the food and traveling mentally into the future, realizing when they need to come back before it, before it spoils. So that's the kind of, displacement that we used to think that only humans are capable of, but now we know. So basically, if you look, animals are amazing and they have many um, um, very sophisticated abilities, and some of these abilities are basically the same as what humans have. And so here, this is a drawing from this paper. Um, it was specifically focusing on uh, the crows and the primates. Um, and uh, claiming that they have causal reasoning because they can use tools, they, use, they have imagination, prospection, the mental time travel into the future, knowing um, where to go, um, um, to, re to, uh, the, to retrieve the food that they, that they hit, and uh, flexi <coughs> flexibility, all of these basic elements of cognition that this, this article claims provide the foundation of, for more complex cognition. But then the question is then why are they still not as successful as humans? Why, do they, why is it that every blue jay does everything exactly the same way all other blue jays before him did it? They don't innovate, they don't invent anything new and humans do. They don't, that's why they do not have this cumulative culture as, as with humans. So if they have the same basic foundations of in, in their cognitive toolkit, why are they not capable of capitalizing on that and going beyond the same thing they always do? So what enables humans to create cumulative culture? There are several um, suggestions that were made. And so one of the most simplistic, I think, is just to say, well, we're just generally smarter. We, um, we have better domain general cognitive abilities, better memory, better reasoning. And I don't think that's a very good answer because, well, we cannot find 30,000 seeds in 6,000 different locations. So they also have good memories. And um, so it's, it's, I think we need to dig a little bit deeper I th there is a big literature, kind of a big group, a school of thought that thinks it's the social brain. We are social and we have social skills, we cooperate, collaborate, we build on that, and that's how we innovate. We have teaching, imitation, theory of mind, metacognition. And I don't, I, I, to me it's not also not really the right kind of answer. Um, because other species also have imitation, teaching elements of theory of mind, at least very basic ones. They don't have the complex parts of the theory of mind. Recently I read a paper that suggested it's technical reasoning skills. It must have been written by former engineers who became cognitive scientists, and they think this is what makes us, that's what enables humans to develop technical potential. But, um, <laughs> it seems like it's too specialized. There are too few people with technical skills to guarantee the success of as a, as a species. And then there is a proposal that is language. And that's the most appealing proposal to me. So in my class that I mentioned that I taught on the, the, the seminar, um, 
um, we discussed this idea um, of core knowledge theory by Elizabeth Spelke, who's a developmental psychologist and she works with infants. And so um, she talks about how all species come equipped with specialized perceptual systems and specific um, task specific cognitive systems, the things that we kind of um, went over. So if you, we, human infants are born and infants of other species, or actually other species of all ages, are born with systems for representing physical objects and physical causalities, so we don't need to learn that. It's kind of pre-built. It's intuitive, basic knowledge that we have about how the world works. So for example, if we know from early infancy, if one marble hits another marble and the second marble moves, it's the hitting of the marble that made it move. That's basic understanding of physical causality. We expect objects to not go through solid place, through solid barriers, or to drop, that fall if we drop down, because we expect gravity to be there, even though nobody taught us that. So this is, this is the basic knowledge that we're born with. Uh, we also know how to navigate through the spati spatial layout, basic navigation skill, um, skills, basic number sense to distinguish quantities, one versus many. Um, and we all have become pre equipped uh, with abilities to recognize and in interact our con specifics. So, basic elements of social cognition or theory of mind. And so, these are abilities that really do not distinguish us from other species. There is nothing unique that you can find if you look at young infants. Basically, young, according to this view, as, as I understand it, young infants are basically like um, other non-verbal animals, animal species. However, when some, something happens that doesn't happen in the animal kingdom, we develop language, and then all of these cognitive developments take off. Um, so, the intuition that she, pr she proposed that, that it's language that gives us superiority or unique ability, you know, unique intelligence, not found in other species. She is not a linguist, and her proposal to me was not it wasn't very specific and not a very satisfying kind of because it just lacked specificity how language does it. Um, Chentner um, has a proposal about how language gives us a unique tool, cognitive toolkit in a much more precise way. And she says that it's because the key to intelligence is analogy, analogical reasoning, and acquiring language. We constantly have to use analogy to compare across situations, compare structures, and figure out which thing is like which other thing. And because that's what we need for language acquisition in her view, and that's what we need to be smart. So, for example, she calls it structure mapping hypothesis. So, for example, the dog chased the cat and the coyote chased the lynx. Uh, they're very parallel structures, so you can figure out that the, the structures are parallel, so the dog and the coyote exemplify the same concept here, the agent. Chasing exemplifies the same type of activity, and the cat and the lynx exemplify the patient. Then if you encounter something like the shark chase the mackerel, the structure is the same, but the nature of the chasing is slightly different, so you, you become more flexible, so your analogy be, it becomes more sophisticated if you are able to see that it's the same, but yet slightly different. And then something like this is even more, is even harder analogy. Amalgamated tire company made a takeover bid for a scene ironworks. Essentially, it's a similar structure, um, but also very different. So, in a nutshell, analogy is the answer it, um, why it is language that makes us smart in the view of gender. Now, our claim. So, Liliana and I, um, in this paper that we submitted, um, so the first part of the claim is that what makes humans smart it's not the analogy, but it's this ability to represent psychologically distant objects. All species are really good and they have amazing, sophisticated abilities when they deal with physical reality, with food, mating, 
whatever physical needs that they have. They can even think respectively, but it's still about food. What, it, what in no animal species seems, at least I haven't seen any evidence for that, is that they can reason about what um, we use the term psychologically distant objects. So things that are not directly accessible uh, to us through our senses. So causes that are hidden, indirect or complex, multi-part. Contents of other minds distant past and future and counterfactual situations. These are some examples, perhaps there, is, there are more, but this seems to be, these seem to be the most kind of the big, the big ones. And so this is what makes, this is kind of a statement that captures in what way we are smarter than other species. We are also the only species that possess, possess generative capacity for hierarchical phrase structure for them. Um, animals might be amazing, but none of them have anything that uh, approaches complexity of human language, and not, no, no species have phrased hierarchical syntax that they use. And then now this is the bold claim that probably many people would uh, push us back on, because obviously there is a lot of disagreement. In, in what way is it that language can bolster cognition? So, first of all, that's an observation. Infants, before syntax, before they're able to put words together in, in sentences, they're equipped with core task-specific cognitive systems, and that's all they have to go with in, for thinking. They can think, but only in these ways. That's what Elizabeth Spelke did all of her work on. So, um, they can uh, figure out cause and effect relationship about two, two events, but th these events have to be contiguous in time and space. If they are not, the infants cannot know that X caused Y. If they didn't see them interact, overlap in space and time. They can um, think and attribute desires to others, like the J blue J example that I gave you, but only if the desires of others overlap with what they themselves want. So if I want candy, I know that my brother also wants candy. Um, no problem there. And they're bound to here and now. But then after you look at children when syntax is fully in place, say they're four and older, then they start be being able to understand hidden causality, divergent desires, beliefs, so divergent when I want candy and you want broccoli and I know and I can understand that you want broccoli and not candy. Um, temporal displacement, you can talk about pa the past, not about something that just happened, but I fell. But something last week, I had a birthday party. Um, and counterfactual reasoning. So if you um, talk about things that actually can never happen, not happen. And so these abilities are supported by linguistic representations that augment our intuitive understanding of how the world works. So, okay, so that's the bold part of the claim. That um, language is not simply kind of, it's not in the sense that Pinker always claims that we have the mental ease and language is just for externalizing. It, they're completely two autonomous independent things. Um, I think our claim is that it's a vehicle for conscious propositional thinking. It's language itself is used as a vehicle for propositional thinking. Linguistic representations are the bearers of propositional thought contents, and so that's another researcher who has that view for others. Um, and um, so that's back to our claim. Without the abstract layers of the syntactic structure, certain types of propositional thinking, if not impossible, I try to say not impossible, but Liliana kept telling me, well, no, they're possible, so okay, I've moderated myself. Um, maybe they're not impossible, but they would be imprecise, they would be basically based on int intuitive kind of thinking, so they would be imprecise, they would be slow, and they would be inconsistent um, for across situations, across people, and language allows us to be quick and precise. So, Basically, what we do in this paper, we look at stepwise cognitive developments 
that were reported in the developmental psychology literature. We looked at causal reasoning, how children go from this mechanistic understanding of causality to more abstract understanding of causality. We look at desire belief attribution from only being able to attribute convergent belief and desire to divergent. Um, temporal displacement, counterfactual reasoning. Um, so it's stepwise, it's well documented in psychology between 24 and 40 months. But at the same time, we can kind of see how the two, it completely overlaps with the stages and acquisition of syntax. So I, I, next I have some examples of that. Um, so for example, language and desire attribution. So first person desires are easy, so even a dog knows. Um, like, you know, the dog wants to play, he brings you the toy, the dog assumes you want to play. Um, the dog understands that his own desire and probably assumes yours, you want to participate in that. But so first person desires are easy, even animals have it. Um, and convergent desire is easy too, so you can, uh, you know, if I'm eating a t tasty juicy apple, my sister also wants it, but no problem in understanding that the mind here. Um, but divergent desire is hard, so if I hate broccoli and he likes broccoli, it's really hard for me to understand that I, that he would want broccoli. Um, and so we claim that so divergent desire is supported by, you need linguistic representations because you cannot really just rely on your gut intuition about what the other person wants. Maybe you can figure it out, but it would be not as quick and precise than if you can uh, um, mentally represent he wants broccoli. And for that, you need syntax of transitivity. So you need to be able to build a transitive sentence. And you need to also have in that structure some understanding of non-adjective transitivity. So not only do you need to know he eats broccoli, but he likes broccoli. And so there's evidence for that. Um, it's indirect evidence, of course, but um, studies show that most 24 months olds are successful with convergent desire attribution. So two-year-olds can pass, they do this broccoli test where they give, them, uh, they give them a choice of broccoli and a cookie and they say, which one do you want? And they, of course, want the cookie. And then an experimenter comes in and uh, takes the broccoli and pretends that they love the broccoli and really want to eat the broccoli and then the cookie the task is give the two things to, back to the child and say, which one does she want? And they always give the cookie, <laughs> even though they just saw her enjoying, pretend enjoying the broccoli. So when they're two, um, unless, so, but they, they are successful if, they, if the person expressed desire for the cookie, then they have no issues with giving her the right thing. So. 24 months olds are st successful with convergent desire, but only a third of two-year-olds are successful with divergent desire. But at three, no problem. Three-year-olds can already understand that people have different preferences and can pass the test. So that's the difference between two and three is sentence structure. Three-year-olds have acquired complete clausal structure. Two-year-olds, I will if, hopefully I'll have time to show you an example. They have this telegraphic little two-word utterances that they use. Language and false belief. Uh, so false belief, this is kind of, I already explained how it works. Two characters, so Sally and Anne. I can't really read which one is what, but ba basically um, Sally puts a, a marble in the basket, leaves the room, Anne moves, moves the marble from the basket and puts it in the box. Uh, Sally returns, where would Sally look for the marble? And so it's, this is one of the more better studied phenomena. Three-year-olds fail this task most of the time, because they say she would look, uh, she'd look in the box, because they, they themselves saw the marble being in the box. But five-year-olds succeed. So what happens uh, between three and five? Children learn, not only do, have they acquired full clausal structure, but they learn subordination. They learn, they have subordinate clauses in their language. And so the claim is that syntax, in order, to, in order to be able to do this task, you have to be able to mentally represent 
Sally thinks that the marble is still in the basket. If you cannot mentally represent that complex thought, you'll be frequently confused. Sometimes maybe you'll get it right, but a lot of the times you'll get it wrong. It's imprecise, it's inconsistent. But with, once you have the structure, for this you need basic subordination, subordinate clauses. Um, then all of a sudden you're capable of attributing false belief. Um, linguistic temporality is another example. So um, children do have ability to remember, even infants. 14 eight to 18 months old were shown to remember the call events for weeks or even months in the lab, in lab experiments. Um, episodic memory, remembering um, kind of events that happened to them. It, there is a disagreement. Some people say it's at three, some people say it's at four, some people just said it's at six months that we can already encode in episodic memory. Um, uh, events in episodic memory. But so they can remember things, but they're centered on here and now until they're about four years old. Their conversations are very much about what's right in front of them. Um, and um, even when they start using past tense, the first past tense is not really what's called deictic past. It does not really refer to past events. It might refer to things that, so, you know, I fell, I hurt myself. That's something like this, mommy, I hurt myself. Something that happened just now. But they do not really recall and talk about things that happened before. So, so here are some examples. I dropped it, I tripped over the, I, I tripped over railroad, I spilled the coffee, so that's a two-year-old. And at the same time, it's inconsistent. They, they do have some past tense, a lot of it is, the past tense is not really established. It, a lot of it is just bare verbs. Um, and when the parent is kind of trying, in this conversation, is trying to um, talk about the past, um, the child is not really able to use past tense. So for example, what did you do in Boston? And Eve says, go on the subway train. So she can talk about the past, but cannot use past tense. So her past tense is really not um, established at this point. And some more examples of that. So the claim is, once it gets established, there is also a shift that was found by cognitive psych developmental and cognitive psychologists that not only is it that they're able to supply past tense, is what linguists found, the psychologists discovered children talk about not just here and now, but what they call there and then. They can talk about the past, they can imagine the future. Uh, they, they stop being locked into the immediate um, here and now. And the thing that um, is really interesting to me was this phenomenon of childhood amnesia that we um, do not remember as adults anything that happened to us until it varies between three and five. So um, when do, um, can you remember anything that happened to you before you were, say, three? Nobody can. Some people can remember as young as three. Many people cannot remember anything before five, so it kind of varies, but something, let's say three and a half is the mean uh, age when childhood amnesia stops, and now you, you're able to recall events after that, even many, many years later as a much older person. Why is that? It's not because young children do not retain memories. Uh, they can retain memories, they can encode, retain, and later recall experiences. So in this study, they tested children who were 10, not adults, and 10-year-olds can recall memories much younger um, than three and a half. So they recall a lot of memories that happened to them before they were two, and actually a number of them remember things that happened before they were six months old mm. and young infants. But then all the children, it, it becomes two and a half, and no longer very young memories as young infants. And then when, they, when we reach 18 to 20, to 20, then it becomes this three and a half years average age of childhood amnesia offset. So what we hypothesized in this paper is that the reason that we forget our earliest memories is not because we didn't form any memories at that time, but because the memories were too fragile. 
um, they were too fragile, they were too um, thin and fleeting because we did not have language to encode. We only had kind of our sensory and emotional um, experiences to go with and no words, no linguistic structures to go with what, we're, what we experienced. And therefore, these things are very fragile and they kind of evaporate and disappear with age. But once we have language, particularly temporality in our language, when we can structure kind of our life narrative, put events on a timeline, which we can only do when we have temporal devices in our language, um, then our mem memories become more st stable and kind of more robust and we remember them for much, much later in life. They're no longer subject to childhood amnesia. Okay, well, um, do, how much time do I still have? I, um, so the, I give you some claims that children, um, like it's the children that were blocked in the here and now. And so I wanted to kind of show you a few examples of conversations, just if, you, if you're not used to communicating with toddlers, this is what um, their language looks like. So this is Adam, who is two, and two years and three months, and his MLU mean length of utterance is 2.25. So the average utterance is two elements. So Mother says, whose suitcase is that? Monroe's suitcase, find dirt, look. What's that? Adam glove, Adam glove, put the ball, put the ball, put the ball. Put the ball where? Tape recorder. Hit mommy, whoa. What? What did the ball hit? Hit mommy, rug. That's a two year old. Um, so it's, how would you characterize this? T telegraphic speech is what a lot of things are missing, right? It's a lot of things are missing. Basically, it's verb and one noun. If you if you were to characterize that as kind of almost the maximum complexity they can build. And it's about hearing. Obviously, this child is not going to tell you, he's not going to tell you about distant past or future, only what's right in front of the, the, what they're manipulating at the moment. Here is a child, she's a lot younger, it's a German child, but her MLU is, um, is similar, so she's also at the two-word stage, but her language seems much a little bit more sophisticated. She has these um, transitive structures, um, and um, so, but it's so repetitive, I just wanted you to get a feel of um, kind of the, because it tells you something about the cognitive side as well as linguistic side. So she's playing with the doll and says, lady has a doll, hands has she, well, it's the German word order, so there's nothing wrong with the sentences. Um, hands has she, feet has she, eyes has she, she points out all the body parts of the doll, 16 lines in the transcription in a row, and doesn't get bored, it's not boring, it's all it, fresh and new, life is great and um, <laughs> fascinating, but the, very repetitive, it's not, not, they're not great conversationalists. The utterances are not contingent on what the doll says, it's only about what they find interesting at the moment. But then this is Laura, she's four and her MLU is almost more than three and a half, close to four. So look at the content of the conversation. So sis, sister, mother is mother and child, child is Laura. So a sister says, Sandman doesn't have his chance, mother. But Laura thought Sandman was God. Is that right, Laura? What does God do? When you go to God, you're dead. <laughs> I see. Right? Right. Because God isn't unintelligible. And sometimes we get unintelligible with God. And they're something, something very sick. You mean that's the place you go when you're done? Once you're better, that minute, that would be the end. Then there's some utterances by the sister and mother, and then the child says, but I thought that was the end of the person. So that's the foyer role. Not only is it much more grammatically complete, she has auxiliaries, so she has all the tense elements, um, tense phrase elements, auxiliaries, embedded clauses, and she talks about basically a philosophical discussion about God. And um, maybe I will, um, if I have time to briefly present the acquisition part of that. 
So we said language stru sentence structure develops gradually in these pieces, and each piece gives you a new cognitive achievement as a child. So this comes from this kind of a parallel to what Liliana said about language evolution. So it's um, syntacticians came up with this idea that basic adult sentence in any language can be schematically organized in these layers. So the TP, this part is kind of the basic clause, and then there is a CP uh, above it. It's uh, for a basic um, simple sentence, there is nothing there. So, so let's leave it for a minute. But so this part, uh, the, the, the lowest layer is, is the verb phrase where we can combine a verb with one noun phrase or DP determinative phrase, uh, which is the internal argument. So that would be the object of the sentence. Um, in, in English, then there is this, the little VP that allows us to um, attach another noun phrase or determine a phrase to the verb, and that's the external argument, so that's the subject. So before, um, so basically this is the intransitive layer, and this, this allows us tra transitivity. Then there is the tense phrase that allows us to have, so the tense element, the finiteness, tense, agreement features, uh, auxiliaries go, go here. And um, the, the subject in the full sentence actually travels um, to, to this position for, to assign case. That's irrelevant for the purpose of the talk. Just, just the, the fact that um, syntacticians assume that there is the tense layer, little vp, vp, and then above it there is the cp, complementize a phrase, allows us embedding. So we can say something like, I think that fish ate worms. Or, uh, it's a place for where WH phrases land when they move. What will fish eat? So that's kind of the adult structure. And so we claim that children build their grammars one step at a time. So they start with this. So when uh, I showed you Adam, when he said something like foot drug, foot ball, hit ball, hit mommy, he is at this stage. Um, um, the German child who, who, who said, the doll has hands, the doll has ears. She already progressed. She built structure up to here. And then the four-year-old already has the um, tense phrase and even the CP because she has the embedding and she has, she has all the tense elements, auxiliaries, and embedding. And um, this progression is not like this. If each phrase, each phase stage is not this neat, discrete stage where one must end before the next begins. It's rather like this, they're overlapping. Um, one overlaps with another, so you can start, you can find some elements of the little VP when the child is still at this stage, when they're building it, but they're imprecise. There are a lot of errors still at that point until it gets established. Um, so basically, th th this slide explains the, explains the sources. And find doggy, see dolly, put horsey is this. VP phrase, if they can say mommy, find doggy, and then they're in the little VP. Um, I have to skip a lot, obviously, because um, I th I, I, but maybe there are questions, and um, I could stop, or I can. <laughs> Um, the, the, the last part, maybe you were expecting me to present you some evidence that that's actually true. Language, once it, it's acquired, allows you to, basically, the, you, you're probably expecting evidence for the connection between you know, language and cognition more than just kind of this indirect one. And so I have um, some of it, um, but I don't know if I should open discuss it or you want to hear more Walter what do you think I don't know I don't know if there are any questions <laughs> Is there a maybe you can stop and get a few more questions and then that might stimulate you to f to go on to the end I gotta go but I have a question okay um, so many early addresses are um, aging object without the word like like Johnny Candy. Yeah. So how would you think of that? Yeah, we structure. 
yeah, it's true. A lot of them are no, do not have a verb at all. And so we just call them they have different types of small clauses. It, 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 I think it would still work, but so it's a small clause of some sort. N nominal. They're, they're just two nouns. Yes? Yeah. I'm really interested in how what you're talking about more broadly at the cognitive level. It's displacement, but it's more than displacement. It's this sort of, um, you know, uh, uh, notion that that you're you're psychologically distant objects relates to folks in the kind of neo Warfian crowd. People like Dan Everett, who has this idea of the immediacy of experience principle. And everyone's been yelling at Dan Everett since 2005 when he came out with that, um, mostly for good reason, I think. Um, but just, um, but but in part just because he's claiming that. Hiraha doesn't have this, that essentially, according to his model, Piraha would not be capable of using or thinking of psychologically distant objects because their language only talks about the here and now. I guess I'm wondering how, without compelling you to step into this very heated, as you know, debate, how the stuff you're talking about relates to that ongoing discussion about Immediate, things that are, you know, that near experience, experience near or experience immediate, um, and, and the, the structure of languages like Piraha. Or is, or is Everett just wrong? Well, I don't, so I think there were some people who said he was wrong about that Piraha does not have embedding and all of these things mm -hmm. like recursion. But, but I mean, I he claims that people don't, like, you know, somebody goes on a boat, goes around the corner of the river, and it's almost as if the people have forgotten they're gone. Um, that's that seems very silly to me. I mean, I, yeah. I don't even know what to say about that. But. I think that it's, if you take this literally, like, no, if you take this strictly, then if it's, in fact, is true that Piraha do not have, in, they do not have subordination, mm -hmm. they should fail false belief tasks. Mm -hmm. And that's testable. And, um, but maybe, I think a lot of it has to do with maybe just wrong analysis of what constitutes recursion. Some people looked at it and said, look, this is recursion. I don't know who, which one is right, which one is wrong. It seems like they're human just like anybody else, and they, should, they have the basic capacity for the same elements as everybody else, just so they should not be limited, adult Piraka should not be limited to this immediate experience, should be able to think about abstract things. and. Um, past and future. But maybe, I think, maybe there are some differences that can be discovered between languages um, in some interesting ways. Okay. Maybe they do not do well on, on false belief. I think that's his claim. But I think he, you know, it's very hard to test that because he's the only one who has he, access. That's right. That's, that's the limitation of this kind of research. Because we cannot all go and um, prove him wrong. Yes. Is there any research or that correlates with these stages are here with the prefrontal cortex development uh, that would maybe at some point, aha, now it can do a plausible structures subordination? No, well, first of all, this kind of this gradual acquisition is not a well accepted theory as of yet. Hopefully, we will change that soon. But um, many gen well, generative linguists really come on the sites that say, well, children are born with all of the structure there. They don't, then, when you ask them, then why do they talk like that? <laughs> they say, well, it's other, for other reasons, some external <laughs> reasons, it's not, but the grammar is all there. But that organ definitely does develop because it's in That's teenage right. boys, you know, if you don't get it until maybe 25. <laughs> That's right. No, I don't think function. That's no it's a good, it's a good suggestion. I think maybe it's a really good, a uh, way to trace uh, brain development through language development. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think many people have, or anybody has done it. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I guess the thing that I got out of your talk was the relationship between memory and language. And I'm thinking that uh, I've been visiting a friend who has dementia. And as I, and when he lost the ability to talk, I also noticed that his ability to remember when I would talk of past events, it just drew a complete blank. So I'm thinking of that in that term, that maybe even 
dementia patients, this relationship between memory and language might be a key thing that you're talking about? Or am I getting it right? So if you lose, well, language, so what we claim that language is kind of the primary element that is a vehicle for more complex types of thought. And then dementia is a memory impairment, right? So I don't know, I'm not really familiar enough to say if there are language impairments in dementia, or is it just purely memory at that point? But it would be an interesting thing to investigate. I think probably there is a relationship between language and memory and dementia. I, yeah, I, I, will, I will have to look into that. I, I mostly look just at children's literature, but I think that would be another really fascinating domain to, to investigate. Yes. Uh, when my father-in-law had mentioned and passed away, he lost his ability to speak English, but he retained his Arabic and then his Chaldean underneath that in layers. So after a while, he would only talk to the staff in Arabic. He talked to English for four years. So it's something that these are sequential in some way. But yeah. Yeah, I looked into that recently. It's a phenomenon that um, the first language, um, so the, the, usually they say it's the dominant language that survives. The less dominant language is the first to go. And sometimes it's, maybe it's the language, your first language, even if you didn't think it was dominant. In some way it is more basic because it was it learned as a native, it was native, uh, I assume. Yeah, na native Arabic and Chaldean speaker at home. But what I was wondering is how his memory is correlated to the language that he was speaking at the time. Mm -hmm. And they have different structures and things like that. That the most recent will go first, and so does memory in the language facility. Yeah, that would be. More to learn. Yeah, interesting. Yes. I had a, qu a question. I was thinking about um, you know, so the increasing causal complexity of the sentences that. Uh, children are, are capable of understanding and producing being a, a kind of opportunity to develop these increasingly sophisticated cognitive abilities. So uh, psychological distance uh, not necessarily requiring, um, well, I, I'm, I'm interested in how you might discriminate between two possibilities. Uh, one being uh, that children become, and I'm also thinking about this in the context of thinking about what kinds of um, um, we were talking about are, are animals smart? Well, it depends on the kinds of things that they're required to do that they need to do to survive. And one of those things that we need to do is to communicate with conspecifics. And so language being this opportunity to develop these increasingly sophisticated uh, cognitive abilities rather than being, uh, as Carruthers would say, the, 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 ve the primary vehicle. Um, so the idea would be that um, language gives us a, an opportunity to practice. Um, rather than being uh, constitutive of these, these kinds of ways of thinking. I, I was wondering if you might have thought about that. Dan Slobins has this expression, thinking for speaking. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. I guess the, the way you're saying, maybe I'm making a stronger claim. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I, I wonder if there is a way to differentiate the two positions. Is it the practicing part of it? language allows us to practice or is language intrinsically necessary to in order to, in order to, for you to be able to think a thought you need to be able to say or represent mentally like using linguistic structures and those kind of things I think if we look at children in development if, if it's true if it, if it turns out that we, we can um, document that um, once a child, a, a, a child can express or pass a certain cognitive test only once they acquire the cognitive uh, a linguistic structure. I think that would actually support our view that it's not really practicing, it's really actually having that structure <coughs> that that is required, right? Um, so I was um, actually, I didn't have time to talk about this, but to it, what kind of support can we find for that? And I was thinking this logic should apply. If factor X is causal for factor Y, and say for fact X would be some part of language and Y some part of cognition, then X has to always precede Y. 
and y never can precede x. And that allows us to then find, to find support. Um, so, and you would, you would look at young children, and so you can form a hypothesis like this, say transitivity is required for divergent desire attribution. So, and, it's, and in this case, it's really our position, not the position um, that language only allows us to, kind of entrains us and allows us to practice it. It actually says literally we have to have, a, to acquire transitivity and then, once we have it, then we can uh, express um, divergent desire attribution. And so we would find two-year-old children and we would collect a language sample and so that we can analyze it in terms of do they have transitivity or not, and then we'll give them that broccoli test that I mentioned, and then we will find children who have both, that they have transitivity and that they, and they can attribute divergent desire, so they would have both X and Y, and it, it goes without prediction. We also would find some children who have neither, they did not have transitivity and they failed the test, uh, we also would expect that some children would have transitivity, but not yet, uh, they have not yet acquired, t acquired tense. Uh, so, um, um, I didn't mean tense, I'm sorry, that's a typo. They have transitivity, but not divergent desire yet, which is also fine, uh, goes with our prediction. But we should not expect to ever find a child who is good at divergent desire, but does not have transitivity. So I think if we can uh, use the schema, we can actually test out a lot of this specifically. And I think it would um, be more in line with what we propose that if this is the case and not something like Dan Slobin's proposal. Yes, um, I, I have a question to, uh, to follow uh, what um, Dawahini asked, uh, Johnny Candy. I'm thinking, no, we know if Johnny wants candy or Johnny eats candy. I think besides the uh, 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 the uh, the two uh, um, nouns, I think the children also understand, for example, the human, uh, the hierarchy. We know human, uh, you know, in English, you have it, you have he and she, but you have it. it there's no di gender distinction. It's only for non-human. So I think kids kind of understand, besides syntax, they understand there are other things cognitively that can help you decode. And also, I, I was thinking for the same reason you mentioned, you know, children understand desire, uh, cause, effect, and uh, temporality. And I think they work together too. So uh, for example, for counterfactuality, you know, counterfactuality again and again, you can see in human languages, they're related to past tense, negation, modal verbs. So it's, I think they're, they really work, it's more efficient, more powerful if you put all the cognitively based uh, linguistic realizations together, they, they work together too. It's not just they are uh, uh, class, I mean, uh, 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 one, one by one it's as, a, as an achievement. They can work together to make things more complicated. Well, yeah, they definitely do. And they have, if you know that proposal that the children come equipped with these basic knowledge domains. They do have intuition about things, how, how things work in the world. It's just language, when language comes, it allows them to solve more complex problems more efficiently, is, I think. Yeah. If, if I can respond to Kayananda a little bit. So, so yeah, that's true that counterfactuality sort of depends on those lower layers, which is tense and modality. So tense and modality are actually in the tense phrase. So I think that's consistent with this view. They first need to uh, nail down the TP layer, and then only after that can you hope to be able to sort of express those you know, more complex CP layer type phenomena. <coughs> like it's kind of layering uh, of, of abstractness, uh, layer upon layer. Not and, and here and now anymore. Yeah, you're, you're away from the here and now. Yeah, further and further away. Yeah, it's, but it's, yeah. Okay, I have a question. I know these are still categories that are being discussed and debated. Interested in the fact that they overlap. When they overlap, 
are they all in this phase during that utterance and all in this phase, or are there like proto complementizer stages where adjacent, two adjacent statements depend on one another, but they didn't use any overt complementizer? Or do, like, can you tell that, okay, we're now experimenting with this? I think I hear other people saying this. I clean my room, time for ice cream, you know, or something, you know, just making putting something together. Like, I'm not sure. If you're overlapping, does that mean you have achieved at times the next phase, or you are attempting to reach the next phase? I, I try to kind of express it in this in this um, diagram by dotted lines. So children, so the solid lines, this is solidly there. Okay. But at the same time, there is this structure, but it's kind of in the dotted line. It's kind of, it's not fully mapped out. Things it's like not, it's not consistent yet, so they might use some expressions that can be that are consistent. I guess I'm thinking more at the higher level. It's like a huge difference between oh. just speaking without uh, clauses. It's, it really is. Um, so children who are at this stage, it, you really find very little evidence that they have tense phrase. They would have, actually we did this um, in the paper with Liliana that I, I took it out of the presentation because I, I knew I wasn't gonna have time for it. But um, we analyzed transcriptions of children at this stage when they're right here. And then we looked at all types of utterances that they had. And um, although there, was some there were some transitive utterances, a small per relatively small percentage, the majority is something more than 60 to 80% would be like that, and maybe like 15% would be transitive. And there were literally no elements that show tr tense phrase. It would be like a, in a 2000 utterance transcription, maybe you would find three cases uh, of an auxiliary, and you and most of them, you could clearly see that they're kind of formulaic, memorized uses. They don't use them. So I think, I, I think I understand your question. So it's kind of, Kind of like this. It doesn't really reach all the way up. I, I th it's interesting, like you said, they have some memorized things that are tools that they have. So some of those, they are being provided with better models as they get older too. But they don't really have a way to analyze it. They just kind of use them. But there is no structure. I don't think there is anything um, that goes to TB, especially not to CP. There is no subordination. There's no WH movement at this point. Um, so I think it's just a better, more um, um, parsimonious way to describe children's language than to say they have everything and then you have to go into all of these complicated maneuvers to explain it away why it is that you don't actually see it, that, to say they don't have it. But then to follow up on that, I mean the really question is then how do you get from one to the other? Because for Chomsky it doesn't matter, right? If you're, if you're a pure generativist, you, it's, it's all there, and it's just going to emerge, yes. sort of, in this sort of, uh, you know, miracle of, of uh, it all being there. Um, but under a gradualist model, which I've heard you guys give talks before, I'm very sympathetic to, there must be either, um, you know, there's a stimulus, so for instance, maybe, you know, exposure, and then there's a reflection going on, oh, I hear these auxiliaries going on, and I'm going to try them out. And then, under what model of my mom's thinking would this make sense? There must be like that process scaffolded by language. There must be these sorts of intermediate steps where the child is reflecting and using language for this. I mean, under your model, where language is the tool that makes us smart, there must be those sorts of intermediates. I'm glad that. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Steve brought the elephant into the room because uh, Chomsky and Bickerton's ideas are a sort of underlying all of this because we, we we're accustomed to thinking that a modern child has already in his uh, cognitive development the potential for full language. It's just the matter of whether or not um, the opportunity to let this knowledge unfold. Um, and so, Derek Bickerton, uh, a, a long time ago, and his theory has been discredited, 
about the the sort of language by a program hypothesis that uh, in a situation where there is so much so much um, linguistic uh, in coitness where there is not a model and children are growing up the young children they they apply their what he calls the natural syntactic uh, mechanism and they come up with a, a language that has mm -hmm. certain characteristics which already has tense which already has some movement because you 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 you, you can have uh, you can have movement to the front. They don't necessarily not, not, not question formation, but uh, they have movement to the front. You can hide like you, you can you can do extra position uh, and various kinds of things. So I was wondering if there is a way, a kind of rapport more between the ideas that you are promulgating here about the gradual unfolding of syntactic abilities as opposed to the idea that Chomsky has in the language organ that this is already there potentially in the child. Yeah, thank you for this question. We actually did um, have a, this kind of disclaimer at the end of the paper that we are happy with either Chomsky idea or the anti-Chomsky idea because I think it can be com compatible with both. Personally, my personal preference is to go along with the idea that um, something like this hierarchy and the way that it unfolds in these steps is maybe predetermined, pre-built. But it doesn't have to be present all at once because when we are born, for instance, we don't have teeth or we don't have any other things that develop later on life, but there is still biological predetermined to appear in on a time, even though there is individual variation, but on a specific, relatively specific time scale. And um, maybe it's like that. So maybe these layers and the unfolding of the layers is a Chomsky innate piece of it. But everything else, of course, you need its input and all the details. Um, is all right, so then this raises really interesting cross-linguistic questions, which I know you guys are also very interested in. We don't need to talk about those today, because I know time is late. <laughs> yes. All right, well, we, we will Thank you. We, we ask our number of questions, and the time is going, so maybe we can thank her very much for now for her talk. Thank you very I, much. Uh, we have an opportunity to come up and talk to her personally. We can read the paper and ask you questions so you know where to find you. <laughs> yes, thank you. Hopefully we will hear from the reviewers sometimes. <laughs> <laughs>